Well, I was on a walk with my family in my all white neighborhood the other day. My son and I were throwing the football. I threw the football, he missed it, and it tumbled into a neighbor's yard that we never met before. And it went all the way up to their window. And I almost went into the yard to grab it. And my wife grabbed my arm and she said, ah, let Losiah go and get it. And I didn't even think twice about it. Yeah. She actually said, the neighbor doesn't know who you are. And I don't want the neighbor to see a black guy next to their window popping his head up. Now, we want to talk about something. Uh, you've gone viral again, but for something way more serious, especially in the midst of what we are going through right now. And it was the Black Bunny video. And you kind of shot it on the DL with your neighbor. Walk me through the story. In case someone hasn't seen it, I want them to hear what was so impactful about the story. GMA even came out and did something with you, too. Good morning, America. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're on kind of all the news cycles right now. Uh, and, you know, this happened last week. It was kind of crazy. So here's the deal. We're living in one of the most polarizing climates that we've ever lived in in America. And with, with kind of racial injustice and a lot of conversations around that, me as a black man living in Nashville, Tennessee, I live in a predominantly white suburban middle-class neighborhood. And all my neighbors, like they're great, but there's this one neighbor across the street who just never has said a word to me. He's never smiled at me. There's been many awkward times that I've tried to wave at the old 70 something year old man across the street from me. And he just kind of looks at me and then continues on his way. And what happened Wally is that I began to build a story in my brain as to why the man wouldn't talk to me as to why he wouldn't, you know, and unfortunately being in the South, I started to build a bias that he didn't like me because of the way I looked. So fast forward four years, never talked to this neighbor. I see him walk out of his front door with a paintbrush in one hand and a bucket of paint in the other he kneels down in front of that bunny. The, oh, he's got two white bunnies in his front yard, like little statues. And he starts to paint one of the white statues black. And I'm watching him with my mouth hanging open. And he finishes painting that bunny black and he walks inside. Now, this was at the height of all the protests that, are, that were happening around the country. I knew in my heart why he was doing that. And it blew me away. So I waited until he came back out. I walked across the street. I, I turned my phone on because I wanted to record, secretly record the conversation for my wife. Um, little did I know halfway through this conversation with the man that I was want to, that I was going to ask him to, to let me share it with the world. But I said, Hey neighbor. And of course, the second I walked across the street into his yard, he was the nicest man on the planet. <laughs> he's like greeting me with the warmest hello and his Southern draw. And he's like, how are you doing neighbor? And I was like, I'm so sorry. This is the first conversation we've ever had. Can I ask you why you painted the bunny black? And Wally, I'll never forget it. He, he looked at me, he kind of got choked up, and he paused for a second. He said, you know, with the climate that's going on in our country right now and all the uh, racial things that are happening, I, I knew as a 73-year-old man that I probably, it probably wasn't healthy for me to go downtown to a protest. Um, but what I did, what I did know that I could do was to paint a bunny black, and that could be my small way of saying that I believe that Black Lives Matter. And let me tell you, Carlos, that I painted the bigger bunny black because <laughs> George Floyd was six foot three. And and the and the and I left the little bunny white because I wanted people to know George Floyd was, was a tall man. So I, I'll just tell you, he started telling me that he told me he was raised by he, he had a servant in the 50s and his family hired a black woman who raised him and did cut his hair and helped showed him, you know, how to brush his teeth and how to do math and, and, and reading and writing. And he just said, I could never see why anybody would look at her any different. Well, Obviously, all the racial bias that built up in my heart against this old white man across the street was immediately destroyed because I walked across the street and I had a conversation. And so I think the video has gone viral yeah. because people I, I, I think this is what we're going to have to do in our country. Like, like, I, yes, like I believe there's a lot of big actions we can do within government and all kinds of things. But can I tell you what I think is going to change the shape of our country? It is walking across the street and having a conversation conversations are going to change our community. And that's why the video went viral. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think before you should go to a picket line with a sign, you should have to have dinner with one of the people that you are completely opposed with, you know, because that's where you learn and that's where we grow. Now, you even said, you know, my bias and, and you in your video, you talked about this, like my bias is a black man, you know, towards this white guy. Did you get any pushback from, you know, your friends or somebody going, hey, this isn't your problem and our problem. It's a problem against us. Did, did anybody push back on you? Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, some people definitely push back on me. I, I think there's definitely a difference between racism and racial bias. Sure. And you know, I, I think there's just there there has to be a definition there. I think racism primarily exists when they're when someone is in a position of power and there's a power structure that is over all, an entire group of people. I think racial bias, on the other hand, black people, white people, brown people, purple people, zebra color people, <laughs> I, all people have racial bias. And and so I just believe that once we once we call out the racial bias in our own heart, I'm telling you, Wally, that is where um, the gospel is going to be begin to be le- lived out. That is where we're going to be able to finally see reconciliation when we call it out in ourselves. I'll tell you this, man, as a white guy, a white 51 year old guy, it can be a little challenging to have these conversations because if you inadvertently, and I'm trying to do the right thing, you know, but if I inadvertently yeah. say the wrong thing because of the sensitivities, I'm labeled a racist. And then the more I try to defend that I'm not a racist, I look more like a racist, you know? And so I think that some yeah. of these sensitivities keep us from having the conversations because we're afraid to have the conversation. And we've got to Oh, like so you good. said, figure out the line between racial bias and racism, because some of it's real obvious. There, racism is blatantly yeah. obvious, but then some of it is yeah. more subtle and it's and it comes more from that bias place. So how do we change that? You know? Yeah. You, you know, I, I think, Wally, that's a great question. I have a lot of my my white friends, which really is most of my friends who are coming to going, I'm scared to say something because I'm scared I'm going to say it wrong. And, and so th- I think there's two things that we've got to figure out here. The first is that black people are less concerned with you saying something wrong than they are with you not saying anything at all. I think at the end of the day, if, if you are going to say something to try to lift up an oppressed community, that is going to, you know, that, that's, that's going to be taken, you know, for what it is. Now, if you do say something that, that is wrong, if you do say something that maybe offends somebody, what I'm asking my white friends to do is to not be so fragile. Like, yes, listen, your feelings may get hurt. You may have to eat your words. You may have to apologize. You may have to do things to back. But listen, I just need you as your black friend to say, I need you to risk a little bit that maybe you're going to get in trouble. Maybe you may say it wrong, but just don't be so fragile and and do what I've had to do my entire life, which is kind of kind of pull up my bootstraps and, and, and go to work, even though it may uh, I may be risking something in the end. So then you're saying that the silence can also almost equal compliance and that saying something oh. is better than sitting there in silence trying not to offend. Yes, absolutely. You know, th- this was a great example was this weekend, uh, Louis Giglio preached a message with Lecrae and he said something uh, in his message with Lecrae that, you know, a lot of a lot of people, black people that maybe aren't of the faith, of the Christian faith, took offense to. Now, Lecrae actually came out and said, listen, I'm just glad he's saying anything at all. He may have messed up. This is the first time he's having these conversations, but let's let's actually like lift Louis up for saying these things and for bringing this issue to light in his community. We need to be applauding him instead of tearing him down. So yes, there's going to be risk, but I promise you that your black brothers and sisters that love you will protect you just as we feel you are protecting us by speaking out. So then you, as a black man, are not offended by white people at protests. Because to me, like, sometimes I think you're like, there's almost this guilt or you're co-opting off of somebody else's thing and you're trying to make yourself feel better, you know, about the situation, but it's not your fight. Like, you're not supposed to be offended by this. So you would say then, yeah, I want white people standing arm in arm with us to say this is wrong. Yes. Go to your local targets, get yourself a sign, paint whatever you need to paint on the sign and go down and stand in front of a congressman or in front of a building in a peaceful way and show the world that you are linking arms with an oppressed community. Yes, we want our white friend there. We don't want you there to take a photo op just so yourself going and make yourself feel better about it. We actually want you there in order to see change happen. Again, protests can change policy. The conversation can change community, and I feel like that's where we need to go. Well, speaking of community, I think the black community has the ear of the nation more than it has probably in 50 years. You know, it's like and and you've got more support probably than you've had before, you know. And so this is a pivotal time and you are a frontline voice in this. It's like so what do people need to learn from this time or, you know, to move forward? You know, I I think. My, my dad, who was a first-generation immigrant as a black Panamanian from Colón, Panama, immigrated to the United States with $20 and a shoeshine kit. 
and he lived the American dream. This is why we live in the greatest country in the world, because he showed up here with $20 cash, shine shoes. Now he's Dr. Fermin Whitaker. And my 78-year-old father on FaceTime the other day, with tears in his eyes, looked at me. Now, he showed up to America when it was still segregated. He couldn't drink out of the same uh, water fountain that a white friend could drink out of. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes as a 78-year-old man and said, Carlos, I think this is the time we finally get equality. He can feel something different in this season. He's been through all the seasons. He can feel it shifting. And if my dad can feel it shifting. Wally, I'm telling you, something is going to shift right here. And the question to ask yourself is, what side of history do you want to be on? Yeah. When you look back at when you look back at the civil rights movement and you see people that were pointing in the face of black people and saying one thing, or you have some people standing with the black people, where do you want to see yourself in 50 years? I'm going to say that's probably going to lead you to the decision you need to make. I think many times white people have a problem in having these conversations, you know, and because of like the term white privilege and stuff, because that tends to lead the, it has the connotation of it being something that you're choosing to do, but there is a, a, an element of this, like I'm 51 years old. I grew up in the South. I've never considered myself a racist and I still don't, but also I never thought that I was part of the problem until recently when, when I, you know, I failed to see that there's a real inequality. You know, and and it took a piece of audio from this black kid talking about his mom's rules for him that made me see it differently for the first time. And that's why conversation is so important. He said uh, his mom's rules were don't put your hands in your pockets. Don't put a hoodie on. Don't be outside without a shirt. Uh, In fairness, my wife has given me that same rule uh, because it's pretty gross. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Don't touch anything you're not buying. Never leave the store without a receipt. Uh, Don't drive with a do rag on or the music too loud. And if you're cop, if a cop stops, you compromise. So of all of those rules, none of those are any rules I've ever given to my daughter or felt the need to give to my daughter. So that was a, a wake up call for there is an e- inequality yeah. and we've got to have that conversation. You know, and, and, and it doesn't end for like young black kids. You know, well, I was on a walk with my family in my all white neighborhood the other day. My son and I were throwing the football. I threw the football. He missed it. And it tumbled into a neighbor's yard that we never met before. And it went all the way up to their window. And I almost went into the yard to grab it. And my wife grabbed my arm and she said, ah, let Mosiah go and get it. And I didn't even think twice about it. She actually said, the neighbor doesn't know who you are. And I don't want the neighbor to see a black guy next to their window popping his head up. And so again, Wally, like, that's exactly what you're talking about is like, like the fact you, you wouldn't have a problem going and get that, that ball in the yard, but I have to think twice about it. And that's all you're saying. And that's all privileges. You don't have to apologize for your privilege but use your privilege. That That's exactly it. I think at least admitting it for the first time for me or for other people to say, yeah, there is a difference in the way that black people are treated in this society. Another example of that, like I, I shoot. And so like I go to a gun range, I like to yeah. target shoot and I drive my self and I have a gun in my car. And so if I ever got pulled over, I go, the first thing I do is I say, Hey officer, I have a gun in my car. It's in a bag. It's unloaded. The clips are over here. Please feel free to take it out. Look at it, do whatever you want to. So you feel safe while we do this. And that's probably where it ends. He goes, yes, sir. Uh, Wally, uh, not a problem. But for a black guy, completely different scenario, even saying I got a gun in the car. No, I've actually had that same scenario. I was going to my, my friend Pete's house. This was years ago. Uh, to go hunting. And I was in my hoopty Cadillac, all slammed down to the ground. I have my flat bill on. I'm not looking like I'm going hunting, but I have a shotgun in the back of my car. Oh, no. And, got, and, 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 so, and so I get pulled over um, on the way to the farm on 65. And I'll be honest with you. I got pulled over and I told, I told this, this, you know, highway police, policeman, I'm going hunting at my friend's farm. In no way, shape or form did this policeman believe that I was going hunting at my friend's farm. I had to convince him to open my trunk and to find my camouflage that I'm going to put on when I get there. And he did. And I'm, it just, it just is different. It is what it is. Sure. I get that. Recently, uh, Bob Goff, he's another speaker like yourself. He spoke at our church and I think he hit the nail on the head to fully understand someone. You have to have empathy and you have to realize that you're not just talking to a person, you're talking to their past and their past experiences. So how do you get another race to ever understand your experience like that? Like, because again, it's going to be so foreign to people 
people because I think the vast majority of white people want to not believe that that happens and not and believe that yeah. there's not inequality. Yeah, and and so I, I don't think that that you actually have to get get a white people has to really understand the complete historical context as much as what I would want you to do is understand me. If you understand my context, it's going to accelerate your understanding of the historical context. So, you know, I can tell you kind of what happened to my ancestors till I'm blue in the face. But when I tell you what happened to me, at right. that point, I think that you're actually going to understand it. There's like a line in history where they will find their own line and say, well, I had nothing to do with that. You know, so why don't we move forward yeah. from here? But you guys are still carrying a lot of the past from your parents, your grandparents that we don't see, you know. And so that's a tough Absolutely. thing to get someone on that page. And I'm glad we're having this conversation because in, fu in full disclosure, I – in prepping for this interview, I wrote, I rewrote, I wrote around. I'm like, should I say black? Should I say African American? Should I say people right. of color? Oh, yeah. I, it's, I, I have scratches everywhere trying to figure it out. And that's the, the, the yeah. problem is that's the small issue that we get caught up yeah. in and we argue about versus the bigger issue of what really truly needs to change here. And that's inequality yeah. in our society. And I think that has to probably start maybe in our churches. It definitely starts in our churches. You know, you look back at Martin Luther King's days, the civil rights movement was birthed out of the local church. It wasn't birthed out of government. And so once again, here we are trying to like place all of the responsibility on our government when I believe that the hands and feet of Jesus that are in the church needs to be at the front line of all these things that are happening. I believe it is the role of the local church. Yeah, and it's tough, though, too, because there, somebody actually made sense of this for me recently. Uh, there was an author who was talking about uh, we don't need to get um, diversity before we get solidarity. And, and his point was yeah. that we have to get everyone in the church that's a, this white church to understand what is and isn't racist before we can bring somebody in and other people in because you're just going to bring them into this flawed system and they're going to leave instantly you know and so when your church yes. believes and you're on the same page then that's when your diversity can grow yes 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 and and i'm seeing so many of my pastor friends who are saying statements from stage well not necessarily from stage right now from the camera right. or whatever however they're doing church but they're making statements that are very risky for them. They're seeing people leave their church. They're seeing things happen because they're risking in order to rescue. They're risking, um, you know, uh, some level of influence in order to rescue what it is that they need to rescue right now. And so when the church does it, Wally, I'm telling you, that's when revival is going to happen. And I love your point about solidarity before diversity. Hey, listen, we know diversity is going to be what it is we're aiming for, but you've got to have solidarity. You've got to be unified in one message before we can even begin to try to make the church look like what it's going to look like when we get to heaven. You want to integrate your churches and you want to lead that charge. But then there is an element of this. It's like if you want to go to a uh, white church, it's to that's, you know, traditionally white, you know, you, you know, want to go to a service. It's an hour long. It's got coffee in the lobby. Uh, it's music with uh, where only the lyrics are sung uh, that are on the screen, you know, <laughs> and so there's your white church. But that doesn't appeal to everybody, yeah. but it doesn't mean you're raised is because you're, I don't have a problem with, with black people saying, I like this form of worship. I want to yeah. do it here. That's not offensive to me, but it feels like sometimes it's offensive if a white church says, well, this is how we do it. And if you're not in this, then we're somehow racist. Can you see the kind of the flip side to that story or the frustration of that? Yeah. No, I mean, no, listen, like, like cultural, cultural ways of worshiping is, is going to be what it is, you know, like, a, a black culture is going to worship different than a white culture. But then also, you know, I go to a, a majority white church here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a black guy, but I like the way the music, you know, happens here. And so you're, you're still, a, again, I, I honestly believe that the power and presence of Holy Spirit is, is the thing that, that is going to be used to draw people into your community. Just because you have mostly white people at your church, I'm not of the belief. Now, there are some black people that are going to say differently than me, but I'm not of the belief that you need to try to make your church 50% black. 50% white. Like that's not, that, that's not the goal of, right. of, of, of what we're doing here on earth. But the goal, what I would like to see if you have a 95% white church is, is 100% solidarity with the black church in your community. Absolutely. That's what I want to see happening. And, and I think at that point, we're going to see reconciliation. Absolutely. I love that, man. So you have a new book uh, that you have just written. Horrible time to release a book, too, uh, by the way. <laughs> you can't get out and promote <laughs> you know, it like normal. <laughs> I can't. 
I can't, I can't, but I'll tell you what, the, the book's called Enter Wild. And if we've ever had a wild season in our lives, you know, I, I think that right now for such a time as this, the Lord had me write this book for this season in our lives to really call Christians to leave their comfortable, safe, little, you know, mild faith. And it's like, hey, listen, and I'm talking to my white Christian friends right now. It's time for you to get crazy and wild with your faith, faith and be the hands and feet of Jesus and to put some action behind your intention and get risky, you know, and, and you've got to get risky in your faith. Jesus was not safe in his faith. Uh, and so I believe the book's actually coming out at the perfect time. Oh, well, that's good, man. I can't wait. My wife is a huge fan of yours. I'm not the reader, so she reads stuff and then tells me about it, which yes. is great. So in closing here, besides your story of the Black Bunny with your neighbor, watching all of this unfold and being part of the conversation, is there a story that has moved you or given you hope for the future? Man, I, every single day. I, I'm seeing stories every single day that are giving me hope for the future. Um, you know, everything from my story with the, the bunny across the street, the black bunny across the street, to stories that, that I'm hearing in my social media. You know, a, a friend of mine, not a friend of mine, a follower of mine, um, she sent me a video of her son. She said, Carlos, my son has been watching your videos with me because I'm doing a lot of videos on IGTV on, on helping my white friends navigate these conversations on race. He's been, he's been listening. He's 10 years old. He's been listening to your IGTV with me. And I want you to see what he was saying. So she took a video. He was playing Xbox Fortnite with a friend of his. He's 10 years old, doesn't know that his mom is filming him. And he swings the, he swings the camera around and he's playing his Fortnite and he's saying on his little headphones, no, listen, it's black lives do matter. I, we understand that all lives matter. Uh. Right now, it's kind of like the... It's kind of like the black lives are on fire. And so like a fireman would only put out the house that's on fire on your street instead of spraying water on all the houses. It's okay to say black lives matter. Wally, I started crying when I heard that because I'm seeing this message go to like little white 10 year old boys that are playing Fortnite. And that is encouraging me. And I feel like that is what's gonna change. And guess what? I'm hoping that when the 10 year old that's playing Fortnite is 30, he's not gonna have to say Black Lives Matter anymore. I, I, I have a feeling that it's my prayer. We're not gonna have to say that anymore because it's gonna be apparent that Black Lives Matter in that moment. And so, yes, I'm encouraged and I'm excited to see what, what, what's in the future. Thanks for watching this episode of Can I Ask You Something? We know that as a Christian, you want to understand and love others better, but it can be hard to find biblical answers to the tough questions that get in the way. So in Can I Ask You Something, we listen with love to personal stories and expert opinions so that through their answers and through their wisdom, we can become more compassionate, more loving, and more confident as we follow Jesus. If you have a question or you're in a situation that's really difficult or maybe taboo, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you around.